Hello, I'm Jonathan Bullard, and you're listening to In Conversation With. Okay, welcome to the second edition of In Conversation With, and I'm delighted to say that my guest for this edition is Caitlin Berry. Hi, Caitlin. Hi. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm well, which is the, the thing that counts right now in, in this day and age. Yeah. yeah. How, how... Just, just for those who, who are listening, probably a few months down the line, we have, we have recorded this while the UK and most of the world is in, in lockdown so, due to the coronavirus. So... Yes, it, it, it strange times at the moment, isn't it? It's weird. It is very weird, but that has led to a, an abundance of of audio chat around hockey, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it seems like everyone's now now picking times to to start talking about it and making podcasts and things. So it's it's fun. Well, we we, we will we will crack onto that later. But obviously, Kate, Caitlin, we we've, we've got you on. You are. I would say pretty new to the hockey scene. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty fair. Um, I, I only really started watching it in 2015. So it, if anyone wants like references, older hockey players or things to me, or like the, the greats that everyone's meant to know, I generally have no idea what people are talking about. But <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I know enough at this point. I think I'm learning. Well, your hometown team are the Cardiff devils so you've been watching them as you say since 2015 it's not been a bad period to watch the devils really has it 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 honestly hasn't um i think in the second year that i got into them or or the year that i first really got into them was the 2016-17 season where i think they won both challenge cup and the league if i remember right so that was yeah i was like okay yeah this is my team and then it's it's kind of gone from there they've kind of been at the top of the ihl since i've been into them so yeah it, i think I, I i picked a good team to get started with well not bad at all i mean could i suppose we'll let you off considering you, you live in, in the cardiff area or you're from the cardiff area so it's, yeah. it's not like you're glory hunting or anything but what particularly attracted you to go and watch the devils for the first time um I think the first time I ever went to see them, it was actually when my um, my sister just dragged me to a game. I, I don't know what attracted her to it in the first place. I think she'd seen it in the Winter Olympics or something. Uh, but she dragged my entire family to a, a Cardiff Devils game. And I knew absolutely nothing about hockey before getting into it. I, I didn't know like how long the game was. Like I didn't know how many periods there were. I had no idea what was going on half the time. Um, but the second I got there and, and there was this there was this atmosphere, it was back when Cardiff had their big blue tent so it it was a very interesting place to watch a watch a sport but the game itself was just super fast like super skilled super exciting like the fans were super like so incredibly just into everything that was happening and it just literally hooked me from that moment on like there was no turning back from that one game yeah i I went to watch a, a few games at the big blue tent a very different venue to the Viola Arena, which the Devils play at now, of course. But the, there was just something about it. It was, for those that don't know, a wooden structure that had like a blue tarpaulin over it, which kept had supposedly kept out all the elements. But the atmosphere in there on, on a hockey night was something pretty special. Oh, yeah, it was amazing. Uh I think it it was also because it, it was quite a small rink. It was, um, I mean, it, the Viola Arena now is still one of, I, I think, the smallest in in the EIHL. But Big Blue Tent was tiny, and there were fans like packing every single inch of it on game days. And that was right when the team was picking up, right when things were starting to go good. So literally, the atmosphere was just amazing. Obviously, now can't be playing out of the Viola just over 3,000 capacity but a nice modern ring a, a modern arena uh, there is a big difference but it, it certainly mm. helped the Devils not only consolidate their position as one of the top teams but go beyond with uh, Champions Hockey League experiences for example Oh yeah, I mean it, it had to happen they had to get something that wasn't a tent uh, considering just 
their their status in the league and everything that's going on. And I think it's been really good for them. Like we had the Challenge Cup back when hockey was still on. That, that was in the Viola Arena, and it seemed to go really well. And yeah, it, it it's just been amazing. Um, like I have to give a shout out to the owners of the Cardiff Devils here because the money and the time that they've invested in this team has just completely changed everything around. Because uh, I think. Just before the time you was watching, you may know about this, of course, the, the Devils were, were in big trouble. Steve King and his court consulting came in and took mm. over the ownership and they've never really looked back since. No, uh, that has to be like a fantastic investment for them. It, it's, it's just gone the way that they hope. Like, they took over the struggling team and they've helped turn the team into like a championship team every single year since. Um, I know the fans are super grateful as well. So, yeah, like props to those guys. It's been awesome. How much of a factor has Todd Kelman been in all this? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that Kelman's been an amazing factor. Um, he's he's not one of those like uh, staff members who's like super distant all the time. He's constantly involved. He's constantly replying to people on on uh, social media. He's he's he he's, he understands what it's like from both a player perspective, obviously, because he used to play himself, and and a, and a fan perspective. Um, and I think ha- having those two things when you're going in to try and like run the, the team or run a business like that, it, it helps massively. And he's definitely one of the reasons why Cardiff are, are, so, are, are so far as they are now, like are, are such a good team. Of course, you've been watching the Devils for a while. What? When did you feel that you was really, really hooked on this sport that you was going every week? When was it that from Cardiff that you started to expand your horizons to probably other leagues or other teams? Um, weirdly enough, it, I, I'd say after the first game I ever went to, I, I literally went home that night um, and, and started looking up like the NHL and things. I, I just wanted to know way more about it. Um, I think where I first like started like massively actually getting obsessed with it was probably... It was probably about a year later, and I'd say in like the 2016, 2017, um, where I started getting like following the NHL and things a bit more religiously, like trying to expand into other leagues, trying to just learn as much as I possibly could. Like I, I'm kind of like obsessive in a way over that kind of thing. Like if if I enjoy something or if I like something, I I need to know as much as I possibly can about it. Um, so that definitely took off in about 2016-17 and snowballed from there. Because you have written about an NHL draft prospect for your, your own blog and, and other blogs as well. Was that the catalyst that then led you to looking more in depth at the OHL? Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether it was that way round in particular. I think I did like start watching the um, NHL draft, I think in about 2016, um, and I did actually realize from there that junior hockey existed and that was just something else that I could um, get involved with and, and, and learn about. And so I think I, I kind of got into junior hockey and then from there I was like, OK, I like these these certain amount of kids, like let's follow them throughout their career. And, and then I, I kind of got into the NHL draft a bit more from there because I wanted to watch it to see where these kids in junior that I'd been watching were, were, were going to be picked and were going to be taken. And it became like this whole thing where I, it's just something that I got super consumed with because I got kind of, I got involved in the community on Twitter and, and the online draft community, which is just massive and wide reaching and fantastic. Um, so it, 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 it was something that I, I really enjoyed and it's something that I, that I could get kind of stuck into. The OHL is where I suppose you, your, your passion is now. You, you, you've got a big love for the uh, kitchen arrangers as anybody who follows you on Twitter would know but your love of, of the OHL has, has really raised your profile so much so that there are journalists and media within that league who, who actually come to you, you you're featured very heavily on, on OHL fan pages, you, you've been over there quite a lot you, you give a media treatment what is it about the OHL that particularly attracted you? I think at first it kind of was that idea of um, progression, like getting to watch these kids throughout, throughout their junior careers and then getting to then follow them to the NHL. Um, I think as I got more involved in it, it was just junior hockey is just a completely different beast from any other sort of professional hockey. It's 
it's just crazy. It seems like anything can happen at any moment. Like score lines can change f- from like quite close, like so- something like four three to like ten three in like twenty minutes. Literally anything can happen, uh, and there's a sense that these kids just want it so much because it's through their junior careers that they can prove themselves and prove that they should be drafted and prove how high they should be drafted. So every single kid on that ice just wants it so much and you can see it and you can see how hard they work and it just makes it crazy and it just makes it super fun to watch and it literally hurt me. What what was it about Kitchener that hooked you for them in particular? Um, I I actually, in I think it was the 2017-18 season, I think, I actually went over to Canada for like nine months for a university exchange um and i i was in waterloo which is like like a town that's twinned with kitchener so i actually got to go to so many kitchener rangers games i i pretty much lived in that arena for that entire year it was like the best year ever because i just got to like drown myself in junior hockey um and i just got super into the team um at, at that point i wasn't writing about it i wasn't like trying to be like a media member but i f- from a fan perspective it was just the best thing ever because that team has such a passionate fan base. It, it, it's a pretty old team in terms of the OHL. So you have like, you, you have fans who are ranging from like 80, like 70, 80 years old. And then like you get people bringing their kids there and it's such like a, a community atmosphere. And then you have this team that are, that have been pretty consistently good. So, and especially in, in the year that I went over to watch them, they got pretty far into the playoffs. I think they got to the OHL Championships, although they kind of missed out at the last hurdle. But I, yeah, it, it was amazing. And it was so fun just getting getting to be there in that environment. And so I've kind of followed them ever since. How, how much do you think that nine months in Canada that moulded your, your love of the game? Oh, yeah, um, it definitely did. Uh before that, I I was a I was a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. I I, I knew quite a bit about the OHL, but not a lot. Um, but being over there in that environment where everyone around you, or mo- mostly everyone around you, knows about hockey, can can speak about hockey. Um, you, you just get involved in this community, which just lives and breathes this sport. You realize how how important it is to so many people, and how much it means to so many people, and that just helped my love for it so much. When did you come back to the UK? Did you go and start watching the Devils again, or was it more the concentration on the on the OHL from that point? Yeah, I think from 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 the time I, I got back to the UK was um, when I started to actually think about maybe this is something I could write about, maybe this is something I can get involved with, in, uh, because I noticed that the OHL, I was in love with it, and it was a fantastic league, but it didn't seem to me to be that accessible uh, to maybe people in different countries or different places. It seems like it seemed like it was quite insular to people over there. And there wasn't a lot of media coverage of it, weirdly enough. It's like it's one of those best kept secret types. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, it definitely is. How much do you think the profile of the OHL in, in this country has been raised, not only by the, the coverage that you give it, but by Liam Kirk? being drafted in the NHL and then being drafted to the Peterborough Peets. Oh yeah, I, I think it's it's been massive for the OHL. Um, I don't know how much of that is is me. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to give more of a thing to Liam Kirk here. <laughs> but, yeah, ever since he was drafted to Peterborough, I was obviously very excited when that happened because this is a British guy going to my favourite league. But also, it brought so many eyes onto Peterborough and then the OHL as a whole. Like, you had... You, you had people buying the streams for Peterborough. You had people like trying to figure out how to watch him, and then you had people following clips and 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 following the Twitter account and and just getting involved in the team because Kirk was on there. And I think that has been just fantastic for the OHL. And obviously, it's been fantastic for Kirk too. Like he 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 not only have has all these British fans who have kind of followed him over, but he has this entire new fan base. And I, I've been talking to people around the OHL, and so many people are in love with him and in love with his story. So I, I think I think both ways it's, it's just been awesome. Of course, now he's at a, a little bit of a crossroads. I, I, I'm right in thinking he, he he could have an option of playing for Peterborough for another season, but 
it's more likely now that he'll probably go to ECHL, AHL, or if he's really shone, he could even get an NHL entry level contract. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, no one really knows what happens for Kirk now because this isn't a situation that's ever that's ever happened before. Um, if Arizona want to give him a, a contract, he could do it. Um, I'm not sure at this point whether he's ready for AHL, but he, he possibly could do ECHL and, and get quite good there. Um, if you want, he, he could stay another year in the OHL, but there's only a certain amount of spots for import players in the league. And next year, he would also be classed as an overager in the league. And there's only a certain amount of spots for those in teams as well. So he'd kind of be taking up two very important spots. So if he doesn't want, if teams do want to keep him in the OHL, it would have to be on a team that that wants him, and so yeah, no one no one quite knows. Um, I hope that someone offers him a contract or something soon because he definitely deserves it. How, how do people get to watch the OHL, especially if you're living in the UK? Is it a case of webcasts from individual teams, like like we have in the Elite League, or is there a league package that people can buy into? Mm, yeah, there is a website uh, called OHL Live, um, and it basically has a bunch of different packages that you can buy. You can buy individual team packages, you can buy ones for just just when they're away, or you can do as I do, and, and there's a league-wide package where you can just buy all of the games from all of the teams. Um, and it, it's a little bit expensive. Um, <laughs> it might only be something to do if you have a real commitment to actually watching quite a lot of these games. But it's 100% worth it to me just because that entire league is super fun. Um, so I always try and push it, even though it's not the best streaming service, but hopefully it's going to get better. I mean, you, you mentioned that you have more got into media side. So what is your me- media role within the OHL? Or, or is it just something from afar as a fan or, or is there something more official there? Uh, right now, sadly, it, 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 it is just a far uh, as a fan. I mostly just I make gifs of, of the funny things that happen or the cool things that happen in games. I, I, try, I try and put them up on Twitter as fast as I can. That's kind of what I've got known for over the past couple of years is just getting clips and gifs and videos out as, quite, as, fast, as fast as I can. I used to do a little bit of uh, stats work for one of the teams over there last year, but unfortunately they didn't continue that this year. Um, so I get a lot of people on my Twitter saying that the OHL should pay me. Um, I'm not going to comment anything on that, but if anyone one day in the OHL wants to offer me money for anything, that would be amazing. I'd be totally good for that. Because you recently went over to Canada in January and you was uh, afforded some media passes and, and privileges while you was over there. Yeah, um, I went... so. I went across for a week and I tried to go to as many hockey games as I could in that week. Um, and I applied for a media pass for the CHL NHL top prospects game, which is where um, all the Canadian hockey leagues, so like Western, the uh, Quebec league and the OHL all send their top prospects just for this one game. Um, and I, I, I got a media pass for it. Uh, they actually, they actually gave me one. It was quite surprising. So I got to go there. I got to meet a whole bunch of people um, I got to sit in Hamilton's terrifyingly high media box and, and, and watch the game from there. And it was it was probably one of the best experiences of, of my life at this point. Um, there's something that that every time I tell people, they get shocked at this, but it, there was one moment where I was walking down a, a hallway outside the press box and Bob McKenzie from TSM was walking the other way. Uh, I was sort of fangirling a little bit, but then he actually stopped me and he was like, oh, you must be Caitlin, right? And it just blew my mind. I didn't know he had any sort of inkling as to who I was. But yeah, his his son, Mike, is the um, is the GM of the Kitchener Rangers. So he, I think he kind of knew me from there. But yeah, I was like shaking. I did not expect that at all. What, what did you say to him? I actually can't really remember at this point. I was just like, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's me. He 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 he, he, he kind of mentioned how he how he reads my tweets and he sees all of my tweets and I was like oh great yeah thank you and then he kind of just left and I think I might have scared him I think I was a bit awkward um, yeah it's good it's, it's quite sad I, I I wish I was cooler in hindsight but I wasn't expecting it but they are them sort of golden moments aren't they that you, you tend to never forget for the rest of your life 
Oh, yeah. It, it is still burned into my memory. I was shaking afterwards. Um, it, it is a fantastic moment just to have someone like that, someone who's like a god in the hockey world, actually know who you are. It just, it was really humbling. It just blew my mind. From the media side, like you say, you, you are well known. You, you've got a hell of a following on, on social media. And, you know, as, as, a, as a female hockey fan, how, how how is that? Because it still tends to be quite a male dominated sport. So mm-hmm. for someone someone like you who has only been watching the game five years, to, to sort of break into that field where you're being recognised by T- TSN announcers must, must be incredible. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It it was actually really weird because when I walked into the the um, media room for the for the top prospects game. It was like it was pretty much all male, apart from like one other uh, female who who I, I got quite friendly with uh, throughout that experience, um, and that was the first time actually that it kind of shocked me um, because doing everything online, doing most of what I do th- through Twitter, it, it is pretty diverse. You you get obviously a lot of men doing things, but there's also quite quite a few strong women voices through through social media, but. So I was kind of fine with it, but then I walked into that media box and it kind of hit me like, oh, this is mostly male. Like, if I, if I, if I wanted to get into doing this properly, then I'm, I'm going to have to actually probably work twice as hard as some of these guys or, or put in an insane amount of effort. Um, but it's never been something that's kind of daunted me and it's never been something that's kind of been on my mind. Even when I was just a fan of the sport, I was like, yeah, it is male-dominated, but... It, it's honestly never, never bothered me. And thankfully, in all of my interactions on online and all of my interactions on Twitter, I honestly haven't had too much backlash for, for my gender and, and what I do. Obviously, you get a couple of idiots like DMing you, uh, asking for your number and things like that. But it, I've, I've not had too much hate and I'm actually super grateful for that because I know that's not everyone's experience. No, I, and I think... Speaking as, uh, as someone who, like you, started as a fan and has sort of got to get into the media, when you have that spotlight, I suppose it's a case you put your head above the parapet so you've got to be prepared to be shot down at times. But I think I, I've had very similar experiences to you mm. in which you do get the odd comment and the odd idiot, but generally on the whole, most people are, are, are pretty good. Oh, yeah, and... I think that also speaks to to the hockey community, um, especially for me the the OHL community, which is why I mostly surround myself with on Twitter. Everyone has been lovely. Everyone I've talked to has been amazing. Even even at the top prospects game where it was mostly men, they were all super helpful. Uh, they honestly couldn't do enough to to, to try and help you or, or or just help out and and give advice and everything. So literally. Everyone I've talked to has been fantastic, and that 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 speaks wonders for what kind of community we're in. Of course, you are at a university uh, in Exeter studying. Uh, I'm led to believe your your degree isn't associated with sport or media. No, not at all. Sadly, I wish. How how do you find sort of time differences? And because you, you I, when the season's on, you're obviously watching OHL. I would think most nights of the week. Does that sort of clash with your studies? I don't think it clashes as much as people think it does. Um, Because the OHL is a junior league and most of these kids are going to school themselves, uh, most of the games are are more on the weekend, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, And that's a lot easier. It does mean I am completely nocturnal on the weekends. Like, I'm staying up to, like, four watching games, sleeping until, like, 1 p.m. Um, But... It, it does actually allow me some time in the week to actually do my degree and actually try to focus on that. I am sleep deprived sometimes, but I love it and I wouldn't stop doing it. it it's 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 something that brings me so much joy. Of course, you have been doing some work for the Great Britain programme. You was in Nottingham recently, but I think that's when I first noticed you is, is as someone who's covered a lot of the GB under 18 and under 20 tournaments. I noticed that you used to sort of clip the gifts of goals very, very quickly after that they happened. So I'd be at a, a under-20 game in Estonia, Great Britain at score, and then probably two, three minutes later, there'd be a gift from you on Twitter. And I'd be like, wow, 
that is so quick. <laughs> yeah, that's that is the thing right now that's kind of, that's kind of setting me apart. The other people on Twitter who do things like that. Um, but yeah, I do love covering those those GB under twenty under twenty and under eighteen games. Um, I I don't think there is enough attention in the UK on the future of of GB hockey. Like there's some there's increasing amounts of attention now on the on the EHL and on the pro game, but I I don't think there are enough eyes on on the kids who are up and coming, like the kids who are the future of the league, the kids who who could lead us into like a new golden age of ice hockey or something, um, and. and that's what I'm. I'm also trying to do when I when I cover those tournaments is be like, hey, just l- watch this, look at this. These kids are really good, and just try and get that sort of exposure. Are you talking around Great Britain? Because obviously, the under 18s and 20s and GB women have had coverage on free sports over the past couple of years. Or are you talking more around the sort of the national league and IHL where the coverage? on a national basis or on a broadcasting basis is probably limited to the teams themselves. I'd say in, in terms of coverage, the, like free sports is doing amazing, but I think the, the sort of the limited team coverage, it, it, it needs to be doing more. I think when I first started trying to write about GB and trying to write about the Elite League, it sort of struck me that a lot of different Elite League teams, like a lot of the information about them and a lot of the history and a lot of like the fan things are so confined to that fan base and, and confined to the minds and the history of those fans it's not really something that that's that's broadcasted or covered or or, or, or put online too much so i think um there there's definitely a lot more that, that that gb media could be doing to kind of get that exposure and and get people interested in like the story behind the teams and the story of the players more than they are actually doing do you think that's some, an area where the game could grow, especially in the UK, where there is more emphasis placed on on the junior games with up and coming players rather than the pro grade game as such. That that's a, it's a hard question to answer, but primarily because there's not so much important placed on the junior game by the executives and, and a lot of people involved in ice hockey. Um, obviously, it's like a very fledgling sport in the UK. And there's not a ton of money in it. Uh, so not a ton of that money is going to the juniors and going to develop and uh, developing them. And that's why we see a lot of these kids going abroad to Europe and and, and trying to get their, their development in, in like America and, and other places. Um, so I think it, it kind of begins at, at the very, very top with with funding it um, primarily and and. And from there, once 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 the junior sort of infrastructure kind of gets off the ground, then we can start covering it more. Uh, then we can bring so much attention to these kids that are so naturally talented. And I think if we start covering that alongside like the, the pro game, then it, it will kind of give people a perspective of where hockey is right now and, and where it's going to be in the UK. As I mentioned, you you were in Nottingham for the Olympic qualifying tournament. So how did that come about? Where you was part of the media team for all that tournament? Yeah, so I I kind of wanted to get involved in that because I I kind of realised that it was it was a tournament that I could go and cover. Um, initially, I was I was just covering it as media, just was going to go there, sit in the in the press box and write things. Um, so I emailed Chris Alice. God bless him. And he said, I, I could do that. And then a week later, he emailed me back and, and he was like, so I'm going to be busy pretty much the entire tournament and we kind of need someone to, to run the media room. Would you be into doing this? Um, and that was just fantastic for me because it, it was so nice to, to to get that sort of trust, despite the fact that he, he probably knew it was something that I'd never done before. Um, I'd never actually met him um, but it, it was. I'm so thankful for him that he actually gave me that opportunity because going there and then actually getting to help out, like in in the media room and, and behind the scenes in this just incredible tournament for Team GB ice hockey, um, it was just an absolutely fantastic experience for me. It was just amazing. The whole tournament, though, it just from from my point of view, like like you working behind the scenes, it just seemed it was like a. a a, a duck on the water where you know serene and graceful on the top but just kicking like mad to stay afloat <laughs> underneath and sort of it, it is a bit it is a privileged position to see everything that goes on behind the scenes 
Oh, yeah. Like, especially that that first day where nothing had got set up beforehand because there was an event on and everyone was just running around like crazy, just panicking, trying to get everything sorted for the games. Um, that kind of... And, and then when actually the game started going ahead and, like, everything was totally fine, they, they went off without a hitch. Like, the fans were probably none the wiser that everyone was panicking just a couple of hours before. It was just incredible to see that, that, that everyone just... That amount of work being put in and that amount of effort being put in just to make something run so smoothly, so quickly. I, I don't think, from a TV point of view, I don't think we've ever set up a production that big so quickly. <laughs> especially considering where we had to run wires as well it was a great atmosphere as well wasn't it the fans really did buy into it and the crowds were, were reasonable even for the afternoon games that didn't involve Great Britain there were still reasonable crowds there and it really did seem to capture the imagination yeah um, that, that's actually one of the things that stood out to me in the tournament was even in the games where GB weren't playing there were a bunch. This, there were still a bunch of fans in the seats. Like people were still going and watching the games. People were pretty much consistently backing the underdog in all of them because we're British and that's what happens. Um, and it was even in those games, the atmosphere was just fantastic. And and to get a, a, a kind of look at that sort of process, to hear all the, all the fans reacting to those games and, and, and to be a part of that, it was, it was just it was a lot of fun. I think we had a chat at, at the time about the Estonian team because they used a lot of their under 20 squad to give them that senior experience and tournament experience they knew they weren't ex- expected to do well so they thought they'd give their youngsters the experience and as a team who I've seen the past couple of seasons at under 20 level so I knew a lot a lot and had seen a lot of the players and then from your perspective where you are a champion of junior hockey that that was pretty special oh yeah um and it was it was so fun to watch, especially in the games where they kind of pulled close. They kind of performed better than people thought they would, um, and just to see those those kids like so young, like some of them are like eighteen, nineteen, um, actually get that experience and actually perform pretty well against these older these like older, more seasoned like veterans in in, in the other countries. Like, yeah, they weren't expected to do amazingly. That's why they kind of sent this really young team, but. To watch them and 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 to kind of realise how how big that this would be in, in in their in their development and in terms of experience, it, it was it was it was actually really good to watch. Of course, Dennis Saskin, who played for Estonia, nineteen years old, and for me scored the goal of the tournament. Oh yeah, he was a defenceman as well, yeah. and he kind of got through um, got through a bunch of players, went straight up and and, and scored his. And that was tripped as he was putting the. Yeah. In the net. It was just a phenomenal goal. Phenomenal yeah. goal. I, I was going to be impartial up in the media box, but there might have been some screaming going on. <laughs> so, just, just moving on and, and fr- from a, another media point of view, but a fan media point of view, and you, you're heavily involved in the Hockey Across the Pond podcast with uh, Mark Rackham, who was also in Nottingham with you. So, how did that? about or that opportunity about. Um, it, it was kind of just through Mark um, we'd started talking on Twitter a, a couple of years ago because we were both kind of Leafs fans from the UK and that, that's not something you, you tend to find often um, so we, we, we were chatting on and off through there um, and then I, when Mark started his podcast up I actually guested on it once or twice um, and it, it's always a fun thing to do because I was comfortable with him because we'd been talking before um, and in January, he messaged me saying, I, I, I'm looking for a co-host. Would you be willing to come on and, and co-host it? And I had like little to no podcast experience at that at that point. I'd, I'd guessed it on a, a couple podcasts here and there, a couple of ones in North America. Um, but I had no idea how to actually run it. I didn't know how to conduct interviews. I didn't know how to do anything. So Mark brought me on, and it was a little bit of a teasing, uh, teething process at the start, as, as everything is. But I, I think we're, we're pretty much settled now. I think I've done about 12 or 13 episodes at this point. So I'm starting to get a handle on it. But yeah, it, that's that's been a lot of fun. And it's been fun to sort of stretch my creativity in ways that aren't just writing or tweeting about hockey and actually learning how to talk about it properly and how to sort of get ideas across in a sort of vocal way, which wasn't actually something that I've been very used to before. 
And you, you are putting out quite a lot of content at the minute. As we've already mentioned, it, it's very strange times at the mo- moment. But I think you, you're putting out a podcast generally about every four or five days. Is that right? Yeah, we try and do one every week. And even when the even when the hockey season stopped and like other podcasts started like shutting down and everything, Mark and I kind of looked at each other and we kind of went, "Well, this is an escape ultimately. Like if." Like, the world is weird right now. No one quite knows what's going on. Like, there's a lot of kind of doom and gloom around. But if people want to chuck on a podcast and listen to two, like, British weirdos, like, just talk rubbish for, for a couple of hours, um, then we were going to provide that. And it, it's, it's not all about hockey <laughs> that we do now. I think in yesterday's podcast, we had a, a segment on, like, our top five takeaway food. Uh, but... It, it's it's fun for us, even even if other people don't listen to it. it. It's it's fun for us to do, and it it provides like it provides a bit of a, escapism from everything that's going on right now. So we're going to continue putting them out probably for the next couple of months. You did one this past weekend as people listen to it. The OHL draft has, has happened for next season, and you, uh, I think you recorded it, but you recorded it as live. So how did that one go? Yeah, that one was a lot of fun. That wasn't really something that either Mark and I kind of thought about too much before we did it. But as the OHL draft was going on, we kind of chucked on the podcast and decided to just do a like a live reaction to like the the, the first three rounds of it. So we, I I done a little bit of prep beforehand because I love the OHL draft and that that's kind of what I, I was interested in. But it, it it gets to a point like a, a couple rounds in where. I don't really know what's going on. Mark doesn't know what's going on. Uh, so we, we were still trying to get this information out, but we were also like trying to chat about things to, to fill the time between picks. And so it ended up being quite a long podcast. I think it was like two and a half hours long, something like that. Um, but it, yeah, it, it was honestly a, a lot of fun to do because it, it was nice not having like a super structured thing like we usually do. One thing I, I did notice from, from your Twitter last week before it, it is you, you, you've been quite open in the past about, about your mental health and how hockey helped you with your, your mental health. And you said you, you really needed that OHL draft to focus on hockey and focus on something again, especially in the situation that we're in now. Mm, yeah. Um, hockey ultimately is it's it's something fun. I know people get super into teams and, and, and it kind of can affect your emotions in crazy ways. But hockey is, is kind of, and I guess all sports, is kind of just an escape from everything. Um, and having ha- having something to focus on that isn't the way the world is right now or, or all of the other stuff I have to do in terms of my degree, um, it, it, it helps so much in, in just kind of removing you from your own head for a bit because sometimes I have I sometimes I I, I have anxiety and and things can get a bit bad but it helps calm things down it gives you something to focus on that isn't just doom and gloom or or stress and especially with the draft when it was something that I could do which would interact with people I I could get in like interactions with people online I could talk to Mark about it um it, it was just something to get so into and so focused on that just completely takes your mind away from anything else that's going on. And I think a lot of people have that in terms of sports. I think that's why a lot of people t- um, watch a lot of sports. And I think that that's one thing that a lot of people are realising now there aren't any sports, that that actually plays a big part in their routine or, or in their day. Um, and, and just having these tiny things within this time of like nothingness is, is, actually, is, is actually helping a lot. I think you're absolutely right, because I think a lot of people should treat sport as an escapism from real life it's, it's something you can get heavily evolved in especially if you are, are passionate about a particular team as well and I think it's been good with, with what's happening is that some teams are now putting on their retro games and they're making a thing of it and they're playing it as live on YouTube at a particular time and I think it's good that things like that are happening that, that the effort is being made it, it's not just sh- shut down the effort is being made to, to keep that consciousness there yeah and i give so much props to like uh team social media accounts and, and people who run these things because 
as soon as everything shut down and, and there was no actual live games anymore, they were still like carrying on, on, on tweeting and posting online. They were playing like online, like connect four and things on Twitter with, with, with different teams. Um, they've kept on providing content, uh, whether that's articles that uh, about the past season or, or things that are, that, that are going on now, they have those games I think a lot of NHL teams doing like the um, NHL 20 like simulated video game games. I, I think that's a very fun way of doing things as well. And I think it's just a way of reminding people like that this is temporary. Like, yeah, I think everything is shut down for now, but we still have sports and, and, and we will get it back at some point and everything will get, go back to normal at some point. And, and it, it's just a very nice way of sort of con- continuing with the fan bases, I guess. Got a couple of questions for you before I let you go. And the, the first one being, where would you like to see yourself, hockey media wise, in a couple of years' time? Hmm. See, th- this is one of those questions that I'm never quite sure how to answer because for me, I've never really had like uh, a specific goal that I've been working towards in hockey. It was just like I started writing because it seemed like it would be something fun. I started tweeting because it seemed like it would be a good way to like expand coverage of the league. Um, so at this point, I'm not entirely sure. I would like to get a lot more involved in OHL things. Um, I, I think the dream for me one day is to is to be able to move over to to Ontario and actually get super involved in things. Um, I'm not sure where I'd like to be on like a journalistic standpoint, but definitely working for a team in some capacity, I think, would be the dream in some way for me. Um, that or, or getting involved in, in more UK hockey because it is something I'm super passionate about as well. Um, but again, like the specific form that that getting involved would take, I'm not entirely sure right now, but it it's definitely something that I'm going to continue doing. And where that takes me, I don't know right now. Uh, and finally, to, I suppose leading on a little bit from that, what would be the ultimate ambition for you? Ultimate ambition would be... I know people say like working for an NHL team or stuff in, in, in this question, but for me, it would be working within the OHL, whether that is like a, a for like running media for a team or something over over there. Um, I know obviously that's not that doesn't pay very well or, or whatever, but I think just getting just being a, a part of that league and being maybe a quite a big part of that league, um, I think that would just be super ful- uh, fulfilling for me, and I think it would be something that's super exciting. Maybe even on a scouting standpoint, getting involved in that. I think that would be the ultimate goal. Caitlin, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. It's been fun.